In this chapter, we're going to cover the topic of vertex animation. Maybe we'll get into a little bit of vision as well. Before we talk specifically about vertex animation, I want to show you the very basics of how this is accomplished. So what I'm going to do is come in here to my vertex shader, and this is uh, chapter 8, start. And this is just the exact same shader that we've been using all, all along, just kind of adding additional features to it. What we've got here is our outgoing vertex position that's been transformed from object space into clip space uh, using our worldview projection matrix. And what we want to do is before we output our vertex, we want to come in here and just say uh, float for object space position equals in dot position. So I'm taking the object space position and putting it into this new variable. Now I'm free to play around with the values of this variable to move our our vertex all around. So what I'm going to do now is just say object space position dot z, and that's the value of going up and down, plus equals, I don't know, let's say like 20. So we're adding a value of 20 to the z position of all of our vertices. So I'm going to save this and come over here to max. And it looks like maybe we don't have the right shader assigned. Oh, I know what it is. We need to say object space position instead of in dot position. So we're multiplying the object space position by our worldview projection matrix. OK, so now we'll save it and come over here. And did you see that? Our teapot and our plane jumped. Now the interesting thing is, if you can see my selection brackets here, the Max still thinks the object is down here. And in fact, if I turn on my wireframe, this is kind of fun. The wireframe is in the original position of the object, but the actual model itself has been raised up by 20 units. Now I can change this value. I could make it something like 50. And now we're jumping up quite a bit. So if I just change these values over here, uh, I can move my model around, and I can put it in different positions. Now what I want to do is, is use this concept of, of moving the vertices around, but I want to animate them. And in order to animate anything in Max, what you need is time. And so what I'm going to do next is show you how to bring time into your shader so that when your time slider is moving, um, something different can happen at each value of the time slider. So in order to bring time into the shader, we need to come up here to our automatically tracked tweakables section and add a new variable that's going to be coming in from max. And we're going to call this new variable time. And we're going to bind it to this term, time, which Max recognizes and fills in with the actual value of the time slider itself. And I'm going to copy this UI widget equals none line here and apply it to our time as well so that nothing is added to our material editor. So now we've got this value of time coming in. And we can come down here and maybe say, object space position dot z plus equals time. Let's see what happens if we do that. So I'll save this, come over here, and now we've got our teapot and our plane down on the same in the same location as they used to be. But now here's the trick. If I slide the time slider, every frame that I move, the teapot and the plane get higher and higher and higher. Pretty soon they just go right off the screen. Because what I'm doing is adding this value of time to the position of the teapot. 
So when we talk about the concept of vertex animation, uh, we're doing it. This, this teapot here is animated, and if I hit play, it's just going to slowly move until it's completely off the screen. Now that's interesting, um, but we may, may want to do a few things to have more control over exactly what's going on here. So let's pause this, and I'll come over here, and I want to explain the concept of a sine wave. Um, I'm going to come in here to my time value and say sine time. And sine wave is kind of like a ping pong ball. It bounces back and forth. So it takes my value, and as my value continues to go up, the sine will make it kind of move in a wave pattern like this. And so what we'll see now, if I hit save, is that instead of continuing to go straight up, my teapot and my plane are going to just continually kind of move up and down like this. Now, there are all kinds of things that you can do with this concept. Now that I have the time value coming in, uh, I can do all, I can use all kinds of functions and formulas to play around with time and the positions of uh, my vertices. Well, what I've decided to do is I've written a couple of functions that we can use to play around with the positions of my verts. And in the interest of time and having you just kind of sit there and watch me type it all in, which is kind of boring, I actually decided to just paste in these functions. So I'm going to come over here and copy these functions from off screen. And now I'm going to come right in here, just above my vertex shader, and I'm going to paste these three functions in. Let's talk about this function, this function here first. This function is called wave, and it does exactly that. So it takes our value, it takes a frequency value, a speed value, and an amplitude value. And what it's going to do is it's going to make our vertices move in a wave shape. So let's come down here to our vertex shader. And right here, we're going to fill in a line to move our verts in a wave. So I'm going to say object space position dot z equals or plus equals rather wave and we'll say object space position dot x now this is kind of interesting I want to explain this but I'm going to fill it all in first object space position dot x 0 0.1 and then our time value, and then 8. Now let me explain what each of these is. This value allows our animation to vary across the surface. Before, when I hit play, like if I just do this right here, the whole thing moves up and down as a unit. But what I'm doing here is introducing this concept of, of uh, a difference based on our x coordinate. So if I look at my little tripod here, my axis tripod, x is, is uh, this way here. So what this allows me to do is each of these verts has a different value on the x axis, right? So if I pass the x axis in and use that in my formula, then each value can be different uh, or behave a little bit differently because it's in a different location. All right, and then I use this value 0 0.1 and come back up here, and 0 0.1 is my frequency. That's how close and far apart my waves are. Then my next value is speed, and for speed I'm just passing in time, and then amplitude I'm using this value of 8. Amplitude is how high the waves are. Okay, so I'm going to save this and come back over here to my shader and wow check that out so now my vertices are animating in a wave pattern so i've got this value of 8 for the amplitude or the height of the waves and if i make this 
Maybe let's set this to 2. And hit Save again. And this is going to make the waves a little bit smaller and more subtle. So that's kind of an interesting effect. And I could make my frequency a little bit higher. And this is going to make the waves spaced further apart. So there's all kinds of things that I can do with this. Now, if I wanted to make this shader really useful for the end user, instead of hard coding these values like 0 0.5 and 2, I could create uh, UI controls like these guys up here so that these values would show up as spinners, kind of like this. And that would allow each, of, each user that used the shader to control the exact performance of the speed, the amplitude, uh, and the frequency of the waves. I'm not going to do that right here, uh, but you're welcome to do all kinds of playing around with this stuff. It's, it's really actually pretty fun to, uh, to play with vertex animation. All right, so we've talked about the wave. Now let's use the next function. The next function is called teeter-totter. And as the name implies, what this is going to do is make our object uh, kind of swing back and forth. And so I'm going to grab this again, say object space position dot y, z. In this case, we're going to influence both the y and the z components of our vertex position. We're going to call our function teeter-totter. And we're going to pass in object space position dot yz. And we're going to pass in float to 0 comma 0. And we're going to pass in time. And let's see. Let's talk about what each of these does. So these are the values that we want to change. Float to 0, 0, that's the position that we're that we're rotating around, or the center axis. And then time is how fast things are going. So let's save this. Oh, looks like I've got an error here. It says, uh, function does not take three parameters. So let's come up here and take a look at our function again. We've got one, two, three, four. You know what? I forgot the max angle parameter. So I've got the center, which is a float two. So right after our float 2, I'm just going to put 1 for the max angle. And of course, end our line with a semicolon and save it. Now let's see what we get. OK, so you've noticed that things straightened out over here. We're no longer all torn up. But when I hit play, ah, now we've got this teeter-totter action going on. So it rotates this way and rotates that way. And if I change this max angle value, something like 0 0.2, what that does is it clamps it to rotate less. So now, in the same amount of time, I'm rotating not all the way around, but just, just a little bit. Now, if I wanted this to go ca faster, I could come in here and say time times 5. Save that. Now we're teeter-tottering pretty quickly. Or I could say time times... 0.2 to slow things down quite a bit. That makes it really slow. So we've got this interesting teeter-totter effect, right? So we're affecting the Y and Z position uh, components with our center and our max angle value, the amount of rotation we want, and then our speed. All right, let's take a look at another one. And this one's just a full rotation function. So we're going to grab this object space dot yz value again. And we're going to say object space dot yz equals rotate. We're going to call our rotate function that we pasted in, which is right here. And we're going to say uh, 
object space position position dot y z and again float to zero zero for our axis of rotation and time and let's see we need two values a center and a time and that's it so we'll save it come back over here and now let's see what happens when I push play. All right, so there's our rotation. So now we've got a shader that's rotating the geometry of our, our teapot. And if I turn on the wireframe again like I did before, this is interesting. So if I hit play here, the teapot's rotating, but Max still thinks the model is in its original position because this position is happening uh, at a later stage. So when we talked about the uh, the vertex and, and pixel shader pipelines, the wireframe is being drawn, and then uh, the verts and pixels are are calculated in the in the uh, on the video card, and so this transformation of my model is taking place after the wireframe has already been drawn. So kind of an interesting effect, um, but there you have it. We've got three functions for animating vertices, a wave function, a teeter-totter, a rotate. And with these things, uh, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can make your object grow and shrink. You can make your object twist and bend. Um, and these are just a couple of the basic building blocks. Uh, but the idea is that you just take the x, y, and z components of your object space position and just apply all kinds of crazy math to them. Uh, with time as one of the values, and then as you as you scrub your time slider, all kinds of fun things can happen. So there you go. Uh, that's vertex animation in a nutshell. In the next chapter of the DVD, we're going to be talking about uh, dissolve effect, and this one's kind of cool. So stick around for that.